Hello and welcome to earlymusicsources.com. My name is Elam Rotem, and today, because you asked, we will talk about Carlo Gesualdo. Carlo Gesualdo might be one of the most famous, or rather infamous, composers of the late Renaissance. Nowadays, he is known for his highly chromatic and modern-sounding compositions. During his lifetime, and in the decades after his death, he was highly appreciated by many. In the 20th century, he was highly romanticized, due to the tabloid-style connection made between the gruesome fact that he murdered his wife and his mad compositions. In this episode, we will have a look at one of his madrigals, and also try to view him in the context of his musical surroundings. Was Gesualdo a mad genius, or just another composer from the late Renaissance? Let's see. Carlo Gesualdo, often referred to as the Prince of Venosa, was an eccentric nobleman who was said to be in love with music. The composer Emilio de Cavalieri reported in 1593 that the Prince of Venosa, who would like to do nothing but sing and play music, today forced me to visit with him and kept me for seven hours. After this, I believe I shall hear no music for two months. Being a nobleman, Gesualdo was already very different from other composers. He didn't really have to satisfy anyone with his music, and had the means to create music, have it performed, and print it in accordance with his wishes alone. The most famous biographical fact about him is that he murdered his wife and her lover, but since he did so while catching them in flagrante delicto, in blazing offense, his murders weren't considered to be against the law of the time, and so he wasn't punished for them, and they didn't hinder him in getting married a second time to no less than the niece of the Duke of Ferrara. Musically, like many composers of his time, Gesualdo was interested in finding new ways to express the text in music, in such a manner that they would move and even shock the listeners. And because the music was only a reflection of the text, in order to have strong music, one had to have also strong texts. This is explained in 1596 by the esteemed composer Luzzasco Luzzaschi, two years after Gesualdo was reported to have abandoned his first style, and had begun to imitate Luzzaschi, whom he admires greatly and praises constantly. I quote Luzzaschi at length, as this text is paramount to the understanding of the madrigal genre of the period. Since poetry was the first to be born, music reveres and honors her as her lady, so much so that music, having become virtually a shadow of poetry, does not dare move her foot where her superior has not gone before. From this, it follows that if the poet raises his style, the musician raises his tone. He weeps if the verse weeps, laughs if it laughs, if it runs, stops, implores, denies, screams, falls silent, lives, dies, all these affects and effects are so vividly expressed in music that what should probably be called resemblance seems more like competition. Therefore, we see in our times a music somewhat different from that of the previous age, for modern poetic forms are also different from those of the past. Another connection between Luzzaschi and his follower Gesualdo is their common interest in chromaticism. Luzzaschi is known to be one of the few from his time who could play the archicembalo, designed by Vicentino some decades beforehand. And this fact is mentioned in one source as one of the reasons for Gesualdo's adoration of Luzzaschi. This instrument, with possibly 31 keys per octave, was able to play all the notes of the mintone temperament without the limitation of having only 12 keys per octave. If you remember, in our episode about temperaments, we explained that in mintone temperaments there are more than 12 notes per octave, and that, for example, B flat was different from A sharp. This must have been very exciting for Gesualdo. Since the dichotomy of diatonic versus chromatic is such a central topic in Gesualdo's music, perhaps it's not a bad idea to try and define it. 
If you remember, in our episode about Musica Ficta, we defined the notes that are found on the Renaissance gamut, which are also represented on the Guidonian hand as Musica Recta. If we think of the piano keyboard, this includes all the white keys as well as the B flats, and commonly also E flat when the transposed system is used. The notes in between those are called Musica Ficta and are used as well, but only as a spice in between notes of the Musica Recta. So one way to define diatonic versus chromatic is by how much the Musica Ficta notes are mixed into the Musica Recta notes. Another, more local way to define diatonic is in the context of a specific mode, and to say that all the notes that are outside of that mode may be defined as chromatic. To demonstrate this, I took the opening of a madrigal by Gesualdo, one from his sixth book, which is notorious for its advanced chromaticism, simplified it to only four parts, and made it completely diatonic. Let's listen. As you see, there is one flat in the system, this means that B flat and often E flat are considered to be part of the diatonic notes. But now, by simply changing the color, the chroma, of some of the notes, Gesualdo turns this innocent phrase into something very chromatic and rather frightening. Let's listen. By the way, since I have only 12 keys per octave on my harpsichord, in order to play this nicely in tune, I had to tune my B flat into an A sharp. That's the B flat. And that's the A sharp. Now, let's listen to it in the way that Gesualdo actually set it, with five singers. The main difficulty with such heavy chromaticism, at least from a Renaissance point of view, is that it leads to deviation from the mode, something that was often considered an error. In our episode Consonances according to Tomas de Santa Maria, we showed an example Santa Maria uses to demonstrate how awkward it is when one deviates from the mode. I can imagine Gesualdo playing this example and thinking, well, I don't see any problem here, do you? It should be said that we don't know what exact view Gesualdo had on modes. It might be that, like some other composers from the time, the only thing that a mode defined was the opening and closing notes of the piece, and anything in between was kind of free. Regardless, due to the extensive use of chromaticism by Gesualdo, in many moments in his music, what we would today call a tonal center is completely blurred. In addition to Gesualdo's music being famously chromatic, it is often very dissonant. Two features that are sometimes wrongly confused. For example, the opening of the madrigal that we heard was indeed very chromatic, but there was not a single dissonance in it. All the harmonies were consonant. Here, however, is the beginning of a madrigal which is both very chromatic and includes highly irregular dissonances. Gesualdo, like other madrigalists from his time, sometimes used dissonances in ways which might be considered wrong from a perspective of most Renaissance theoreticians and interestingly, also considered wrong from a perspective of later Baroque theoreticians. Due to this, Gesualdo might be mistaken for being reckless or incompetent in that regard. But if this were the case, we would expect to find more basic contrapuntal mistakes, such as parallels and such. Since we do not, we may conclude that his deviations from the common rules of Renaissance counterpoint are conscious and deliberate. 
Now that we have a general idea about Gesualdo, chromaticism and dissonances, let's have a look at his madrigal Se la mia morte brami, if you desire my death. Another madrigal from his notorious sixth book of madrigals. Interestingly, this book, as well as the fifth one, was printed on a press Gesualdo established within his own palace. One must wonder whether these works would have been printed by a commercial press if the composer wasn't of such a high and wealthy status. As explained by Lutsaski, stronger music demands stronger text. And like most of the texts chosen by Gesualdo, this one is no exception. It is very strong and dark. I will read to you the translation of it. If you desire my death, O cruel one, I shall die happy, and even after death I will adore only you. But if you desire that I not love you, ah, with the thought alone, grief kills me, and my soul flies away quickly. The first line starts as an imitative duet of the higher voices, which is then followed by a duet in the lower voices. On the word crudel, cruel, all the voices join in in an exclamatory and unorganized manner. And on the word moro, I die, there is a harsh dissonance. After this, the same thing is repeated, imitative writing, but with a different combination of voices, the crudel moment is much stronger, and the moro moment now in five voices, and thus even harsher. Let's listen. By the way, due to the use of high clefs, here it is transposed down a fourth. You might have noticed that the voices imitate each other in a very loose manner, basically keeping only the direction of the movement. The actual intervals and note values are different for each entry. This is a very high degree of variety that might contribute to the unstable feeling one gets sometimes when listening to Gesualdo's music. On the word crudel, the quinto voice sings a G and an F, followed by a rest. In relation to the bass, it is a sixth and a fifth. However, there is already a held sixth in the tenor, which makes the fifth that the quinto is taking a wrongly used dissonance. There are legitimate ways to have a fifth and a sixth together, but the way it is written here is not one of them. The dissonances on the two instances of the word moro, I die, are not easily explained. It would have been fascinating to hear Gesualdo's explanation. The next bit is even darker. Talking about loving someone after dying, it includes a series of 6-4 harmonies. 6-4 harmonies were used a lot by Lutsaski, for example, Gesualdo's idol. Lutsaski, however, made sure to always prepare them well and resolve them well. Here is an example from his madrigal Cormio. I'll play the harpsichord part. Beautiful. Back to Gesualdo. Since the sixth is a consonance, one does not need to treat it in any special way. But the fourth, being a dissonance, must be prepared. Well, here, in two cases, Gesualdo simply uses unprepared fourths, which appear out of the blue, as if they were consonances. And in here, it's not completely wrong, but the rhythmic placement and the preparation and resolution are so awkward 
it just doesn't sound right. The following part, with the text I will adore only you, apart from being varied rhythmically and textually, is all consonant. Let's listen. The last part of the madrigal starts unexpectedly with diatonic homophony. Quite a rare thing in Gesualdo's music. But don't worry, on the words il duol mancide, grief kills me, we get a highly chromatic progression that includes two questionable six for harmonies, which really leaves us hanging. This is repeated again transposed the fifth lower. One may theorize and try to justify and understand how Gesualdo ended up with this particular contrapuntal progression, but again, without Gesualdo, it will be as good as guessing. The last line of text, and my soul flies away quickly, is composed with quick and imitative music, just as Vincenzo Galilei complained that composers are doing all the time. On top of this, Gesualdo adds a sudden stop on fugge, flies away, to imitate the sudden way it is done. Let's listen. In this case, we are quite lucky to get a standard cadence at the end. Some madrigals by Gesualdo end with things which are not really cadences. Just as an example, here is the ending of the madrigal Io pur respiro in così gran dolor. I won't even comment on any other aspect, as it is simply so amazingly wacky. Now, after these unsettling musical examples, let's go back in time to two composers that laid the foundations of Gesualdo's style, Cipriano de Rore and his student, Luzzasco Luzzaschi. Cipriano de Rore's second book of madrigals for four voices, published a decade before Gesualdo was even born, has some very chromatic moments that I think Gesualdo would have appreciated. Here is an excerpt from the madrigal Schietar Buschel, where on the text, I must burn, and while lamenting and desiring, finish my miserable, unhappy life, Rore uses highly surprising harmonies.
dark but fair. Some two decades later, in Lutsaski's second book of Madrigals, when Gesualdo was ten years old, we find a setting of a scene from Dante's Inferno. The text describes the sounds one hears when entering the underworld. Truly spooky stuff. Let's listen to a bit of it. In Lutsaski's later books, from the time he knew Gesualdo, the madrigals are already taking the shape which served Gesualdo as a model. One could really say that Gesualdo did not invent much, he just felt slightly more free when going down a path already set by others. And he was not alone. It might be difficult to specify what is so individual in Gesualdo's music in comparison to some pieces by, for example, Giovanni de Mac, Pomponio Nenna, or Scipione La Corcia. Here, for example, is an excerpt from a piece by La Corcia, from a madrigal book printed in 1616, three years after Gesualdo's death. Despite Gesualdo being not that musically special in his surroundings, there is one very interesting thing about him. Both during his lifetime, and even more so in the decades after his death, he was regarded highly as an innovative composer. Right after his death, an unprecedented score publication of his entire madrigal oeuvre was printed. This kind of a score would suggest that his pieces were so great that one might use them to study counterpoint in general, and to appreciate the genius of Gesualdo in particular. The amount of praise he received throughout the 17th century is abundant to the extent that it baffles some scholars. While some agree with it and see his works as brilliant and of unparalleled boldness, others criticize his freedoms as creating defective and disjointed scraps of polyphony. In the 20th century, Gesualdo enjoyed a revival, primarily through the romanticization of his bloody history. Dozens of musical compositions, novels, films and operas took inspiration from the image of Gesualdo as a mad genius. So whether you like Gesualdo's music or it gives you a bellyache, he cannot be ignored, neither musically nor historically. This was our show about Gesualdo, we hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to check the special page on our website with all the footnotes and other extra information. If you enjoy early music sources, feel free to support us on Patreon. Comment, share and like. See you next time at earlymusicsources.com.